look at several passages together this morning, Acts 16. Uh, in regards to our men's conference, I'd like to mention if you have, uh, this is, we're not promoting our church. If you want to bring a neighbor man or a guy from work or something, as long as he's not got a chip on his shoulder, because we're not going to cut any slack, all right? It's going to be pointed. And uh, so we uh, would love to have, uh, you know, they can come to our church, our men's conference, and go back to their church. We're not, I've never tried to recruit people. I feel if God, God knows where he wants his kids to be, they can visit here. If they like it, fine. If they don't, fine. Um, but anyway, just so you know, you're, you're welcome to, to bring people. Also, you find Acts chapter 16, being the first of the year, I thought I would do something warm and fuzzy and uh, read a poem. How about that? Uh, since I'm at the beginning of the year, I'm going to be nice. It was the month after Christmas, and all through the house, nothing would fit me, not even a blouse. <laughs> the cookies I nibbled, the fudge I did taste, all the holiday parties had gone to my waist. When I got on the scales, there arose such a number. When I walked to the store, less a walk than a lumber, I remembered the marvelous meals I'd prepared, the gravies and sauces, the beef nicely rare, the pies and the cakes, the bread and the cheese, and the way I never said, no thank you please. As I dressed myself in my husband's old shirt, and prepared once again to do battle with dirt, I said to myself, as I only can, you can't spend the winter disguised as a man. Go so away the last of the sour cream dip, get rid of the fruit cake and every cracker and chip, every last bit of food that I like must be banished till all of the additional ounces have vanished. I won't have a cookie, not even a lick, I won't, I, I, I'll want only to chew on a long celery stick. I won't have hot biscuits or cornbread or pie. I'll munch on a carrot and quietly cry. <laughs> I'm hungry, I'm lonesome, and life is a bore. But isn't that what January's for? Unable to giggle, no longer a riot. Happy New Year's to all, and to all a good diet. So anyway, God bless you. That's your warm and fuzzy moment for the day, okay? So Acts, <laughs> Acts 16, I stole that. I didn't write that. I'd, it would have been better had I wrote it, but uh, no. Acts 16, let's stand for a moment as we read the scripture. You know, I just love that verse, the righteous shall be made fat. It's in the Bible. It is, it is. I'm not sure what it means, but let's, let's eat to it. Acts 16, the Bible, the story is of the Paul and Silas out preaching. They get in trouble for getting people saved. They get thrown in jail. And they're in jail. Um, they're singing at midnight. We'll talk about that a little bit. And we're coming into the story where the, uh, the jailer and uh, other people come into the story. So look, if you would, at verse 25, Acts 16. Verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. By the way, whenever you sing and stay on top, when the world is falling apart, you're help to somebody. You're, you're lifting up the cross and saying God's big and good and faithful, and, and, and even in my sorrow, I'm going to keep believing. Somebody knows. And obviously some people heard in this story. In verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and every man's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him, the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his straight way. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning. And I thank you that we've got the book that's living. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. But not only do they bring life, they're alive and powerful. And 
These are the things we need in this country, and we need them in our homes, in our hearts, in our churches. We pray for your teaching and your instruction. Help us guide my words and guide our thoughts that we might have something we need for this week in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bible open there. We're just going to take a couple of minutes. This morning I'm speaking on the simplicity of salvation. Uh, salvation is simple, and we're not talking just about salvation. Understanding most of you understand the this, the, the plan of salvation. Many of you have talked to many others about Christ. But I want to, first of all, let's go back in the story briefly. Paul and Silas, how'd they get together? Well, Paul got saved in Acts chapter 9. We may get to that, but if we don't, Paul got saved. He was uh, a religious leader, and he's looking for someone to travel with him. And through a gathering of God's people, they pick out Silas, and basically Paul said, hey, come travel with me. Be like me, I'm going to go start another church. And I grabbed one of these teens, Josiah McDowell, come on with me and uh, be my partner in church building. And boy, he'd be excited. We're going to go. I get to work with the pastor, man. It's going to be great. And then we end up in jail. Boy, that's great. And uh, just because you're in the will of God doesn't mean it's easy. Just because you're where you belong doesn't mean there's not going to be some heart problems and, and uh, health problems and family issues. Um, battles come. So here Paul and Silas are in jail. And uh, in those days, tradition says it, I couldn't prove it, but supposedly in those days, if your prisoner ever escaped, they killed you. And so that's why, and often they said, you know, you hear all these, we're looking at 2,000 year old writings, so I'm not gonna, you know, put my name on the line, but people say that if you were, you let someone go, they'd burn you to death in your own clothes or worse, you know, all kinds of torturous things to motivate guys to not let anybody go. And so here this guy, he's sleeping in the story, and the earthquake wakes him up. He sees the doors open, the, and thinks, oh, they're all gone. He says, I'd rather fall on my own sword and kill myself. I don't know if I could do that. That just seems very painful. But anyway, uh, and Paul says, hey, don't do that. We're all here. So he calls some other guard for a light, and sure enough, they're all there. He goes into Paul and Silas's cell, and the first thing's out of his mouth, what must I do to be saved? Now look at that, if you would, in verse 31. The answer from Paul and Silas. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and join the church. <clears throat> quit your drinking. Quit your wife beating. Quit going to the bar. Quit gossiping. Didn't say any of that, does it? It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the house. Now, first of all, salvation is simple. Salvation is simple. He said, now look, if, if, uh, if somebody came to, to uh, the average religion today around the world, they would line up this long list of things you got to do. Two types of, of religion in the world, do and done. All the religions, I don't care what you want, unless it's somebody I've never heard of. I've talked to people from, from Hindus to Baha'i and Mormon and Catholic and Jehovah Witness and Church of Christ and Muslims. And all. Look, they're all lumped up together here with one common word, do this. Now, whatever it is doesn't matter, but they've all got something for you to do. When you come to true Bible Christianity, the word is not do but done. It's all done. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Done deal. And so you can lump the religions in the world in your mind. Are they a do religion or are they a done religion? And what Jesus did on the cross is done. It's all paid for. And so they came to this jailer, and the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? By the way, very good question. The Hindus uh, kneel before hundreds and hundreds of statues hoping to find mercy. The people in Islam, they'll blow themselves up, shoot themselves, chop off people's heads, hoping to please Allah to find that, that elusive salvation. And it doesn't matter, you know, if you've got to stand on the street corner with the Jehovah Witnesses, maybe that'll get you saved. And again, I've talked to these people. They're not bad people. Their religion has lied to them. And wonderful people in all kinds of churches around the world. But it's not the Baptist church that gets you saved nor any other church. It's Jesus. And he says very simply in verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Simple as that. Now, could I say also in regard to salvation, it's not a process. It's instantaneous. There in the very next verse, they go to his house 
they speak the same words, we're assuming, to his family, and the jailer and his whole family gets baptized immediately. By the way, could I tell you, if you're saved, you ought to get in the baptistry. You say, well, don't I need a class? He didn't have a class. The day of Pentecost, they baptized 3,000 of them. They didn't have a class. Now, the church I came from, good church, great people, a lot of folks got saved there. But before you ever got in the baptistry, you had to meet with the deacons and give them your testimony. And they sat there and evaluated whether you really believed or not. Now, every, you know what? You know what's great about being an independent Baptist? It's none of anybody's business what we do. But could I tell you, especially you that are newer here, we really want it to be by the book. We're not perfect. We really want it to be just like God says. And in Acts 16, as in Acts 2 and Pentecost, when people got saved, they put them in the baptistry. Simple as that. There's no way they had a six-week baptism course on the day of Pentecost. They got saved that day. They got baptized that day. And here in Acts chapter 16, that night he accepted Christ, and that night he was in the baptistry. Now, if you've been saved and never baptized, come on. The water's right there. It's warm. We'll put you in a girly blue robe. Well, wear your clothes. I don't care. And we'll baptize you. Say, why? Because God said to. Why, what does it signify? Well, we think it's a symbol of the one who hung on the cross and was buried and rose again that you love. But the main thing is the simple obedience. It's your public declaration of your internal faith in Christ. They got saved. So, number one, salvation is simple. Number two, it's immediate. I don't know how many times I've talked to people when I've been out soul winning. And I've said to people, if you died today... Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Very common answer. I'm really working at it. I met a guy not long ago, very active in one of the big churches in the valley. And, um, and he said that. He, I said, if you die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? And, and he said, well, I'm really working at it. And I said, wow, you know, I, I, I don't want to offend you, but if I could show you how you could get it, would you like it? Look, you can't. Let me, let me take a parenthesis here in this sermon. The reason I have to get saved is because my sin demands punishment from God. We all in agreement on that? The wages of sin is death. Over in Revelation, it says that the liar, all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So in my past, I have sinned. Those sins demand payment. Those sins are going to be punished by God with rejection by God. Have to be. So if I'm working at this thing of salvation and I'm getting a little better and a little better, I mean, I'm climbing higher and I'm going to one day I'll be good enough to be saved. Let me explain something. If I never sinned again, which let's just say it ain't going to happen because I'm married. <laughs> That line wasn't in the first sermon because my wife was sitting right over there. <laughs> they didn't say more in the second hour. <laughs> my mom and my wife both were in the first service. So I had to be nicer. But no way. It, but let's pretend I never sinned again. Have I sinned? Yes. Must those sins be punished? Yes. So if I finally achieved my karma, my, my no sin life, I'm going to hell. Because I have sinned, sin must be paid for. It's going to get, look, my sin, your sin, all sin's going to get paid for one way or another. Either you'll pay for it or you'll let Jesus pay for it on the cross 2,000 years ago. Here I am. I'm driving down the road, minding my own business. Hey, how about this guy? I, I heard him on the radio this week. Um, I don't know the whole story. You might know better than me. I just get little glimpses of radio when I'm driving. But some guy had done something some years ago with banking or whatever, embezzling, I don't know what, and he disappeared. And some judge declared him officially dead and he was off the scene dead 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 well somebody uh, pulled this guy over his windows were a little too tinted and asked for his ID didn't have any ID and talked and talked and talked found out it was this guy that had been declared dead now do you know he had violated all these uh, whatever he did wrong way back here you know he'd been a good boy all these years since then and so they took him to the police station, and I'm sure he said, I just want you to know, I've been real good. 
I've not stolen, I've not cheated, I've not even sped, I've even stopped at stop signs. And at that point, the police probably said, well, you're free. You think? Try that with your warrants. Try that with your mother-in-law when you've been mean to her daughter. Hey, I'm guessing the guy's in jail. That's just my guess. And could I tell you, God is much more holy than our legal system. In fact, I don't know if there's anything just in our justice system. But I'll tell you what, your sins and mine are going to get paid for. The only way to get your sins paid for is to go to hell yourself and pay for it or let Jesus suffer the, ju the judgment of God for you. There's no other way. So let's make this thing clear. Back to the sermon, parentheses is closed. The fact is this man, he was a jailer. He was just your normal Joe guy on the job, just like you at your job. He meets somebody on the job. And he says, what must I do to be saved? And on the job, the guy says to him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He's working a midnight shift. The guy says, wow, I believe. He takes him to his house after work. They get off work. It's three in the morning. He, he says, tell my, my wife and my kids about it. He tells his wife and children about it. And that night before the sun rose, they were all in the baptistry. So number one, salvation is simple. This was no big, uh, elaborate plan. It was no big, you've got to pass a nine-week course to get saved. It was no, oh, let's see, do you really understand it? Oh, we'll get into that more in a minute. So number one, it's simple. Number two, it's immediate. All right, quickly now, look in your Bible. Let's go back over. Um, let's see where we're going to the book of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3, very familiar story. Most of you know it already, but I want you to think about it in light of this. And could I say... If you're not saved, this will help you this morning. <clears throat> but my biggest concern is keeping our church right. Because great churches throughout history get off on this matter of salvation. Young, young people here this morning, teenagers, boys and girls, get this solid. Because when I'm dead, some preacher's going to come in and start messing with the doctrine of this church. And you young people need to say, hey, that ain't right. Somebody's got to stand up. Go to his office privately first with about 30 of you. Right. To say, we're voting you out Wednesday unless you, unless you get back on track. Better to fire him anyway. You get off on salvation. What he wants to do is send your grandchildren to hell. Right. Don't let anybody mess with salvation. You can differ in a whole lot of things, but don't, don't differ on the blood of Christ. John chapter 3, very familiar story. Most of you know it. Jesus, it's in the night again. And here Jesus is, and this religious leader came to him. In verse 1, there, there was a man named of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, we're going to start out with this. This is a ruler of the Jews. He's a Pharisee, one of the highest. We, look, if he was in the Catholicism, he'd be an archbishop or a cardinal. If it was in... in uh, uh, some of the church, he'd be the high priest. This is a big shot, okay? He's way up there in the religious ladder. Verse 2. So the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher, come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, he comes up like most religious people, buttering him up with religious jargon. And could you see him coming to some famous preacher in America? Wow, I saw you on the TV show, and you're just amazing. And who does your hair? And wow, who does your makeup? And, you know, you must... You, and he'd say, oh, well, you know, it's just all about me. Whatever. Come to Jesus. We know thou art a teacher. Come from God. Nobody could do what you do. And Jesus says, unless you get born again, you're going to hell. Amen. That's called preaching. That's called just get right to the point. We're not here trying to be soft, warm, and fuzzy. That's the poem at the beginning. We're here trying to get people out of hell. That's the issue. And now, so point number one in the Philippian jailer, salvation is what? Simple. Salvation is what? Simple. Number two, salvation is immediate. So what is number one? Salvation is simple. And number two, it is you get saved when you get saved instantly. You're born again. Your name written in the book of life. Heaven, your home. Your sins and your, all of your sins are gone. Uh, Hebrews tells us their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Instantly. Number one, it is simple. Number two, it is immediate. Number three, it's for the religious people. It's for the religious people. Look here at verse three. This religious guy, he came to Jesus, and Jesus said in verse three, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, that means um, 
Any of you kids ever have your mom call you your first name, your middle name, and your last name? That's verily, verily. <laughs> He's really wanting to get your attention. So uh, it never happened in my house, of course. Um, verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, there's more to the story, but the summary is this. Religious people need to get saved. You read in Acts chapter 9, I didn't go there, but Paul that was in jail, Paul was one of the biggest, religious, the, the biggest religious leaders of his time, and Paul needed to get saved. He's riding along, going up to the, Damascus, and he was so passionate about his religion, he was jailing believers, he was killing believers, he hated, he, he could have qualified as a Muslim today. You know, I hate you so bad. I love my God so much, I hate you, and I'm going to kill you. And Paul was doing that. And, and Jesus comes along, slaps him down, and says, what do you think you're doing? In the actual verse, Paul says, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And Paul said, I am in big trouble. That's in the Greek. You've got to know the original language to know that. No, Paul, Paul, Paul thought, oh, could you imagine? You're out there killing Christians and jailing them, and you hate the name of Jesus, and this, anyway, so, but Paul got saved, look, religious people need to get saved, over in the book of Acts, there's a story of, of the Ethiopian eunuch, he was the, he cared for all the finances for a very famous queen in Ethiopia, he was a Jewish man, he came all the way up to Israel to worship, on his way back, he's in his chariot, he's reading his Bible, and there, reading his Bible, Paul says to Philip, the preacher, hey, get on over there and tell that guy how to get saved. Religious people need to get saved. Could I say something? You could have been born in this church, raised in this church, and be 20, 30 years old. Can I tell you? You need to get saved. You need to get saved. You say, well, pastor, I've been in Baptist churches all my life. You need to get saved. Well, I've been raised, I was Lutheran. Somebody did tell me this one day. said, I was baptized by the Mormons, the Lutherans, and the Catholics. I've covered all my bases but the Baptists. <laughs> I said, you know what? Let's forget about the Baptists. Let's talk about getting saved. You need to get saved. If you don't get saved, you're not going to heaven. I, you don't have to become a Baptist. You don't have to come to our church. You've got to come to Jesus. And here... This religious man in John chapter 3, and he's trying to be warm and fuzzy and theological, and Jesus just hammers him. You need to get saved, Nicodemus. Now quickly look over to the book of Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. There's not enough time to get to all this, but uh, I love this passage in Mark chapter 10. Now we're talking about salvation. We said number one, salvation is simple. And then we said salvation is immediate. It's a simple thing. Salvation's an immediate thing. It's not anything hard or difficult. Then over in John chapter 3, we read that salvation is for the religious crowd. Religious people need to be saved. Religion doesn't save you. I went back over. On this side, the religions of, the, of Christianity is done. Jesus did it all. On this side, all the religions of the world, it's all the things you've got to do. And, and I'm not a religious expert, but I'll tell you, I've talked to people around the country and around the globe from all different religions, and they're, they're all into this, what do you got to do stuff? And you come to this church, if we're doing right, if we tell you the story the way that if you hear it right, which I, I really labor to make it right, whether it be children or adults, it's already done. Would you accept Christ? What do I have to do? Trust him. How good do I have to be? pretty bad and I remember my years ago Mrs. Goddard at a class for years I mean years and years 20 years all of our classes were on buses and um, or under a tree or under a brush arbor or whatever and she had a class on a bus classroom full of kids and on our Sunday school bus and and uh, she said uh, she asked the kids explained about salvation and uh, how many of you have sinned you know all of them raised their hand but one little boy she said, you haven't sinned? He said, nope. She said, you've never lied? He said, never. She said, you've never been mean to your brothers or sisters? He said, nope. And my wife, only the quick wit and wisdom of a woman. A man would have thought of this midnight in bed. She said, that's too bad. 
you can't get saved because Jesus only saves sinners. And he looked at her and he said, well, you know, maybe I did sin once. <laughs> I thought, I hate it when she's so smart. I'd have argued with the kid and tried to prove he was a sinner. <laughs> found his brother, you know, geez, that's just too bad. You can't get saved because only sinners get saved. Oh, I hate it when women are so smart. Mark chapter 10, look at this. Let's get off of people that are superior to others. Mark, Mark chapter 10, look down at verse 15. We don't have time to go through the whole story. There's some kids coming around Jesus and some people trying to keep the kids away. And I looked at this a few weeks ago. I won't belabor it, but I want to bring it into this context. Mark 10, chapter 10, verse 15, Jesus is talking and he says, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter therein. Now hold your place. We're going to read some more. And we're having an invitation tonight at church. And so I said, if you'd like to get saved this morning, if you need to get saved and uh, you understand you're a sinner and you understand that Christ died for you and you're willing to trust Christ today, please slip forward. Let me have someone talk with you. And over here, a 40 or 50 year old man or lady comes forward and say they want to get saved. And over here, some six, eight year old kid comes forward and he says he want to get saved. And you're the average uh, uh, pharisaical adult religious person. And uh, you look up there and you think, well, I'm sure glad this person's getting saved. And they got, but I don't know if a child could really understand it all. Now, could I tell you what God's saying? God's up in heaven talking to the angels and saying, he's in good shape. Now this guy, we better make sure he gets a clear explanation because that 50 year old's gonna have a problem believing. If you've ever done much soul winning, you tell a child, Jesus loves them, they'll believe you. You tell a child that Christ died for them, you'll believe it. You tell a child that, you know, we're all sinners and they'll admit it openly and candidly. You tell that to some adult religious person, you're gonna have to wrestle them through all their theological nonsense they've had in their head. Hey, how about this? You, uh, your, child, your grandchild, you're over there at your house and the grandkids are visiting or maybe the neighbor kids are over playing with your kids and so you get some cookies and soda pop or whatever and you say hey while we're sitting here eating let me tell you a great story how jesus died for you and you're sitting there they're munching away in their cookies and and drinking their coca-cola and you're filling their sugar vessels to the tops and um and you say isn't it great how jesus died for you mm -hmm. chomp chomp and uh and do you know jesus would love to save you and take you to heaven when you die yep that's good go 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 and uh and you say if you would just ask jesus to save you he'd save you you believe that and the little kid six eight whatever years old 12 yep that's good you want to do that mm -hmm, sure that'll be fine all right well let's pray and you pray and they pray with you and you walk away thinking oh i wonder if they understood it i'm not sure they got it and i wonder if i explained it right and you know what the kid walked away saved. You're the one doubting. Because you're the one, you're doubting you, and you're doubting the kid's intentions, and you're doubting the kid's understanding. But right here, as clear as you can read in verse 15, unless the 50-year-old gets the kind of faith the 5-year-old has, they're not getting saved. Look at that next verse, verse 16. And he took them, plural, up in his arms, and put his hands on them and blessed them. The little children he's talking about, look, you think I could pick up Micah and Josiah and Colton? Well, yeah, with these beefy muscles, I could. I mean, the average man. <laughs> I pick them up and bless them. I don't want their bad breath and B.O. that close to me. Jesus is talking about little kids here. And he says, disciples, you don't get it. Unless the adult gets converted like the child, they're not going to be saved. Look a few verses over. The disciples are struggling with this thing. By the way, if you're wrestling, you're in good company. So were the apostles. And they're kind of wrestling through things. They got talking about people who have money and the rich and the affluent. And look over, if you would, at verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words. And Jesus, I'm sorry, verse 23. And Jesus looked round about and saith to his disciples. I'm in Mark 10, verse 23. And Jesus in the middle of the verse says, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples are thinking, what? 
And these adult men and women that have money and position and esteem, and Jesus says it's going to be hard, and they just couldn't catch it. They were astonished. Verse 24, the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again. He repeated himself and said to them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust, and that's the key phrase, this next phrase, them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And verse 26, they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And the disciples, they're, they're like us. They get confused. And they're thinking, well, if the people whose lives are together in money and houses and land and pensions, and they vacation, and they, if they're not saved, who can get saved? That is the next great question this morning. Jesus answers it very simply in the next verse. And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, with men it is what? Could I tell you, with the Pope it's impossible. With Pastor Goddard it's impossible. With the priest and the rabbi and the religious leaders it's impossible. Because no matter how many good deeds you want to come, you, you say, I got to crawl up, I was at Mecca, or I was at Vatican, and I kissed the Pope's toe. I, mean, I don't care if you got, if you got uh, uh, foot fungus on your lips. <laughs> With men, it's impossible. Well, I got baptized by Robert Schuller in the Crystal Cathedral. With men, it's impossible. Well, Pastor Goddard, you baptized me in your own baptistry. With men, it's impossible. I said, number one, at the very beginning, salvation is simple. Number two, it's immediate. Number three, religious people need it. Number four, children can get it. And number five, God's the only one that can give it to you. Look at that next line. With men, it is is i don't know where i am but anyway it's in there somewhere you look at it verse 27 with me with, jesus said with men it is impossible but not with god for with god all things are possible the only way you'll get born again is when god saves you not a church not a preacher not a religion let me tell you something the little kids in the five-year-old sunday school class right now if they bow their head and ask jesus to save them he'll save them that 80-year-old in the rest home this afternoon, if they'll understand that they're a sinner and that Jesus died for sinners and that Christ would save them by faith, and if they're willing to let go of their trusting in their money or their good works, that 80-year-old in the rest home will get saved. That guy in the jail this afternoon, we'll have several jail services over the weekend. That man or lady in the jail today or yesterday, if they'll bow their head and understand, and they don't have to bow their head. The thief on the cross was pretty, he was tied up. He couldn't kneel. Um, if they'll just admit they're a sinner in need of a Savior and ask Jesus to save them, in the jail they can get saved. Look, the little child in Sunday school, the rest home, the jail service, on the street, at work, salvation is, number one, simple. Number two, you remember? Immediate. It's not a process. It's not something you work at. You're either saved or you're lost, and the minute you get saved, you're not lost. It's a done deal. Number three, religious people got to get saved. Your wonderful religious Aunt Gertrude, she needs to get born again. Now, she may have already been saved, but if she's not saved, she's not going to heaven. So it's your job to make sure she gets saved. Number four, children can get it. It's simple. A child can get saved. Number five, only God can save a sinner. Now, let me wrap all that up. Maybe give you, let me give you number six in 30 seconds. Don't turn there. Write it down if you don't know the verse. 1 John 5, 13 says this. These things have I written that ye may know that ye have eternal life. If I could give you point six without expanding on it, you can know you're saved. You can know. Not wonder. No, not hope, no, not, well, perhaps, no. You can know, K-N-O-W, you can know. You can know you're saved. Well, I'm homeless. God will save a homeless person easier than he'll save somebody in a big mansion. I've been at the rescue mission in downtown L.A., other different missions, preaching. And I'll tell you what, some guy will come down an aisle, and his body's not been bathed forever. He's slept in cardboard boxes. He's eaten free food from the rescue mission. And I could explain Jesus loves you and died for you and... 
Do you understand you're a sinner? Yes, I do. Do you, do you believe Jesus loves you? It's a wonderful thing. Would, he, would you trust him? I sure will. Go up to La Crest and knock on the door and see how it goes up there. I've knocked on doors all over La Cresta. No, I've rattled gates. <laughs> it's hard for a rich man to get saved. It's hard. But I understand a child can do it. Now, with all that being said, there's six billion people in the world, and every one of them would like to know how to be saved. It's our duty to tell them. You've got a grandchild, make sure your grandchild's saved. You've got a great-grandchild, make sure they're saved. The neighbor kids, make sure they're saved. See, why say kids? Because kids get saved easier. <clears throat> tell them. That's why we run those buses out there, because kids will get saved. We've got adults all over our church this morning who rode those buses as kids. Kids get saved, grow up, become adults, and they love the preacher when he's old and boring because he loved them when they were little and bratty. I love it when our kids grew up riding our buses, go off to college and wherever, military, come back here and call this their church home. Praise God. You know what? I put up with their irritating things during church, and they're going to put up with my irritating things when I'm old and decrepit. It's our duty. I'll tell you what else, it's the decent thing to do. I read yesterday that, uh, I can't remember the year now, but when the polio vaccine was invented, that, that year... 36,000 people died of polio. You want to know what's criminal? To have the polio vaccine and not give it to anybody. It's criminal. But I'll tell you, Saul had a problem because nobody believed him. He had to convince them. He had to keep looking and looking and trying to prove his point. And he, had to, he went to people who didn't believe him and had to argue their way through it. And finally, the breakthrough and people started accepting it. That's what soul winning's like. People don't understand. But it's our duty. Look, six billion people on this planet. That's why we send money to missions. That's why we pray for our young men and young ladies to go to the world and get the gospel to the world. Why? Because it's free. It's easy. It's simple. A child could do it. But unless someone tells them, they're going to hell. And it'll be our fault. Because we didn't send somebody. We didn't print Bibles. We didn't send a missionary. Why, why should a missionary spend two to three years trying to raise enough money to get overseas? Man, they ought to have it just right. Just like that. Pack that money up and go. Bunch of tightwad Christians spending more money on TVs and internet than they are on the missions. I don't think it's wrong to have cable TV. I think you ought to look at what you give to the foreign mission field and look at what you spend on cable TV and compare them and see which one's God. And um, I'm not against cable TV. I'm just against not supporting missions. Uh, our heart ought to be packed up for the cause of Christ. Salvation is simple. Salvation is immediate. Salvation is for the who? Religious. Salvation is for the child. And only God can save you. Simple as that. Let's pray. Father, bless us as we go today. I pray you'd help. Uh, our goal this year is to get the gospel out to the world as much as we can. We do a whole lot of soul winning and we do all kinds of things getting the gospel out. But, it, but this year we're going to work a little harder at it. But I would be very much amiss if I didn't make sure everybody in this room was saved. And if someone here in this room is still trusting their works, I pray you'd help them realize that only God saves a sinner. It's not of works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to your mercy. And Lord, if there's somebody struggling, I pray you'd help them to figure it out. It's an adult struggling. It's not going to be a child. And then I ask, Lord, for our all of us, that we would realize that kid who walks by us, that Sunday school class that needs a teacher, that mission field needing a preacher, lady or man to just come get the gospel out to that jungle, to that little city, they need to get saved, and it's our job to get it done. I pray you'd call our young men and young ladies to the mission field. I pray you'd call them into the ministry that there'd be more churches started like over at South Shore just starting their fifth, their seventh Sunday today. May we make a difference because of the simplicity of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.